This is the notion that says we're, we, we're going to take whole programs, we're going to decide what observations we're going to make of those, and then we're going to say two small pieces of program are equal when whenever you plug them into a context to make a whole program, they give you the same observations at the end of the day. So here we're, we're choosing to observe just the, um, just the final state of running the program. So we say two commands are contextually equivalent just when, whenever you have a context, which is a big program with a hole in it, written with this dot, um, then if you plug uh, C into that big context and start it in some state S, that terminates in state S prime just when plugging C prime into the same context, giving it the same starting state, terminates in the same, um, uh, uh, same final state. So again, this would be a different relation if we cared about how long programs took to, to run, for example. And so now, this denotational semantics lets us justify some equations that hold up to contextual equivalence. So this says you can replace a program uh, which contains this command you can replace this command locally within a big program with this command and you'll always see the same observations. So this is assignment to two different variables. So if you say x gets three and you follow it by y gets five, you won't be able to tell the difference between that and y gets five followed by x gets three. And for example, things that come from the reduction semantics as well. So, so if you have uh, uh, a conditional test on zero, then you know that this thing is gonna be contextually equivalent to the, uh, to the second branch. Um, and, uh, and some more interesting ones here. So this shows that you can distribute uh, uh, the continuation into, um, into branches of a conditional statement. So you can bring the C inside the, the branches. So, we're all, so what we're interested in is the equations that are satisfied by bits of our programming language um, uh, up to some notion of observation. So we can, we can vary this quite a bit. So partial functions get a bit difficult to work with once we go uh, up to higher type. So one thing we can do is we can move instead, it's a bit of overkill for while programs, but we'll want it for, for other languages. We can go instead to, um, to omega CPOs instead of sets and partial functions. So omega CPOs are partial orders um, which have least upper bounds of all omega chains, which are just what we're gonna want to interpret recursive definitions. So if you have a, uh, a natural number indexed increasing chain, then there's some element of the, uh, uh, of the post set which is uh, greater than all the elements of, the, of the, um, the chain and less than anything else which is greater than all the elements of the chain. And the continuous functions are things that preserve the order and least upper bounds. So we can, instead of using sets and partial functions, we kind of take this set store and we'll turn it into a rather trivial flat CPO which just has all the states up at the top and sticks the new bottom element underneath all of them. And then uh, we can interpret commands as strict functions from this lifted domain of stores to this lifted domain of stores. So now it is, is this is total. The things that were undefined previously now map to this new bottom element representing non-termination. So this operation of taking a domain and, uh, and sticking a new bottom element on it is kind of pictured here. And I've tagged the things up at the top with square brackets. This is the domain and this is the domain lifted. Um, or uh, this, is, this is kind of, uh, this has sort of gratuitous information in here because we can give us input a store or bottom. Uh, and uh, a slightly nicer way of formalizing this, instead of saying it has to be a strict function, i.e. preserving bottom from store lift to store lift, we can say, well, the meaning of a command is a function from stores to stores lift. We only have to say what it does um, on, uh, on, on defined stores because we know what it's going to do on a, if, if, you, uh, if you never reach it, um, you'll end up with non-termination. But if we do this, then sequential composition of commands becomes something a little bit more interesting than it was before. So up here, the meaning of sequential composition would just be composition of continuous functions. But down here, if we've got C1 and C2, or C0 and C1 rather, um, then C0 is a function from stores to stores lifted, and C1 is a function from stores to stores lifted, and we want to plug the two guys together, uh, but, uh, but uh, C0 is returning a stores lifted, and C1 only tells you what to do with stores. So the way we get around that problem is we, we do this operation on the, uh, on the denotation of C1 to kind of push it back into, into this space. So, so C0 here is going to take us from stores to stores lifted, and then C1 takes us from stores to stores lifted, and we're going to extend that up to a function from stores lifted to stores lifted. So this extension operator, this star here, is a general thing that we can define for functions between any CPO. So if F is a function from X to the lift of Y, then F star will be a function from the lift of X to the lift of Y, and it's defined to be, well, pretty much the only thing it could be, um, if the A that you put in over here is actually the lift of something in X, then we just apply F to it. But if the A that you put in is the bottom that you added, then you put out the bottom on the right-hand side. Okay, so that was, a, that was a, a deterministic language. We were able to model our commands as, as functions because for every input state, there's a unique output state that you get. 
we had a non-deterministic language, um, so we added a non-deterministic choice operator here, so the operational semantics of this is very easy to give. So C0 choose C1 in a state S can take a one-step transition to just C0 in state S or a one-step transition to C1 in state S. So now we can't model our commands by, by functions anymore, or at least not simple functions. Um, so we, we might naturally move to interpret commands as relations between stores. So, so uh, uh, a pre-store and a post-store are related in the meaning of C just when it's possible for C to take you from, uh, from the pre-store to the post-store. Um, so then sequential composition gets uh, interpreted by relational composition and, uh, and everything goes, um, goes smoothly. Now this is very common, but I mean, again, we've made a really non-trivial choice here because this semantics has made a choice about observations that you might not have even noticed. You might just have written this down without thinking about it. But in actual fact, this semantics has the property that it identifies the meaning of any command with that command, non-deterministically cho choice this command, while one do skip. Now, this, this, this program here always diverges. So, so if C were, let's say, skip, right? So then the only thing C can do is it takes you from a state uh, 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 to itself. Uh, has no observable effect on the state. This guy, on the other hand, non-deterministically either leaves the state alone or goes off and diverges. Um, and this relational semantics, sometimes called the angelic semantics of the programming language, will identify these two, uh, these two programs. So we've chosen only to observe the collection of terminating behaviors in giving it this relational semantics. And if we wanted to be more precise and make the distinction between these two guys, we'd have to do something different. And that's the kind of thing that we can really tease out with, with the imitational semantics very, very carefully. So an equivalent to this, uh, this relational semantics, instead of saying the meaning of a command is a relation between stores and stores, just as with uh, the deterministic language, I went from partial functions to continuous functions from uh, uh, stores to stores lifted, we can do something which looks quite similar in giving uh, the semantics of this non-deterministic language, this angelic semantics. So I can take the meaning of a command to be a function from stores into the power set of stores. Now, this is just isomorphic to, to the relations here. So the, the, the idea is that for a given command, uh, its denotation tells you the set of, uh, for each, sta each input state, it tells you the set of states that you might get as an output. So if we do things that way, then the meaning of sequential composition, it was relational composition up here, we have to express it in a slightly different way. So again, it looks very similar to this. So the meaning of the sequential composition of commands, C0 takes you from stores to sets of stores, C1 takes you from stores to sets of stores, and we want to compose the two. So we have to take the meaning of C1 and lift it up to be something which takes sets of stores to sets of stores so that we can compose the two things together. Um, and there's an extension operator of much the same shape of this. So F is a function from X to sets of, set of Y, then F star goes from sets of X to sets of Y, and the definition is that when you give it a set X's over here, then you apply F pointwise to each X in X's, and then you get a set of sets, and you do a big union operation to squish them all down together. <coughs> so moving on to a, a slightly more uh, interesting programming language. I guess everybody's seen this a million times before with the language of simple types, so I shan't dwell on it. Um, so Simple type programming language, we've got functions, coproducts, products, a uh, unit type, and an int. It has entirely standard uh, um, typing rules. Um, um, the arithmetic operation is just a sort of generic thing. You can feel free to add uh, anything you like, and I assume everybody has, uh, has seen this uh, um, a lot of times. Now, we can give this thing a denotational semantics or an operational semantics. It's not really a programming language yet. We can't write uh, uh, general recursive functions in this uh, in this syntax because we don't have any recursion. Um, so this is actually going to be a, um, a strongly normalizing language. But we can still kind of pretend and give it an operational semantics in various different styles. So one style is to give it a call by value operational semantics and another to give it call by name operational semantics. So for the call by value, we identify some bunch of terms as values. We're going to evaluate closed programs, by the way. So um, actually for those purposes, I don't really want X in the set of values. Um, so for a call by value lang language, the values are going to be the things that are evaluated and don't, need, don't get any further, um, uh, further reduction applied to them are going to be any lambda abstraction, a pair, both of whose components are values, uh, an integer constant, or one of these tagged, uh, um, a tagged value in the, uh, in the disjoint union type, so in left of V where V is a value. And then 